So uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm Brian Croxel. I'm in uh, BYU's Office of Digital Humanities, and we're really thrilled to be co-sponsoring with Digital Matters at the U and, and a host of other uh, names that are on the bottom of the website and the announcement that I, I, I should have written them all down, but I didn't, but we're thrilled to be partnering and, and working on, on collaborative things as much as we can in this time of weirdness. Um, so uh, Rebecca and David asked if, I, if I'd introduce Julia uh, and, and my first draft of the introduction was simply to write down uh, don't you know who Julia Flanders is and just kind of leave it at that. But that, that seemed a little uh, not as professional as I, I perhaps should try to be. So, so I'll do this really quickly, um, quicker than, than I could because there's a lot one could say. Um, but our, our guest today is Julia Flanders. She's a professor of practice in English and the director of the Digital Scholarship Group in the Northeastern University Library. She directs the Women's uh, the Women Writers Project, one of the longest running digital scholarship projects, I think, in the world. It's, it's been going since uh, 1988. She began working at the WWP in 1992, moved from proofreader to managing editor, text based editor, project manager, oh, until her uh, current apotheosis as director. And early in this journey, she was involved in the transition of the WWP's encoding schema. Um, yeah, I mean, the session is still there, right? Then, yeah, I would just re-export them. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's mute all these people. There we go. Okay. Uh, anyway, she, Julia helped uh, transition WWP to the newfangled guidelines released from the Text Encoding Initiative. This experience was the first of many related to TEI. I would bet if you've learned text encoding in the United States in the last 20 to 25 years, there's a strong chance you either learned it from Julia or from one of her colleagues slash students. Uh, in another apotheosis, she uh, then served as the chair of the TEI consortium. She also served as the president of the Association for Computers and the Humanities, which is the US-based professional association for DH work. She helped establish the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization, which is the global meta organization of DH scholarship. She currently serves as editor in chief of Digital Humanities Quarterly, which is an open access peer reviewed journal. And while it's hard to tell because her online profiles tend toward modesty, I think it's fair to say that she is a, if not the founder of the journal, along with Neil Freistat, she's the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Textual Scholarship more recently, the co-editor with Photos Yanidis of The Shape of Data in Digital Humanities. So as you can see, Julia Flanders is involved in every bit of digital humanities scholarship, whether you, are, whether you are encoding a text, giving a presentation about that work at a conference, or publishing about it, you are working in a space which she has cultivated. Uh, truly, we are all poppies in Flanders' field. So I couldn't be more pleased to have Julia Flanders here with us and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, that's just extraordinarily generous. And um, I wanna thank uh, Rebecca and Brian and David and Marisa and everybody who has worked over uh, the course of what feels we were just reflecting earlier today, a, a, a several years um, attempt to um, make this happen against all the obstacles. <laughs> so I'm I'm so so delighted to, to be here and to see everybody, and I'm I'm grateful to everybody for coming out. Um, and I also want to say, especially in the face of that um, really lovely introduction, that I feel like these days um, my job is very much a managerial one, and I you know I I enjoy it and I I treat that as a kind of research topic. But um, it means that I feel very humbled around the multitude of, of kind of what I can't help still thinking of as like real scholarly work that people are doing in digital humanities um, and I'm sure is represented in this group. So I always feel a little bit like um, these kinds of talks are an opportunity for me to get back to topics, which I'm actually not really that expert in anymore, um, if I ever was. So um, I will, I'm, I'm, I'm treating this as a, as a kind of an exploration of my own, and I'm really looking forward to your responses and thoughts um, in, the, in the questions and discussion. So I am going to now do the little bits of bureaucracy of getting my screen share going, and hopefully this will not um, break anything. There we go. And now I'm gonna present, which means 
I can, there, yes, it seems to be working. Can everybody see slides and hear me and everything, all that? Okay, fantastic. So um, again, thank you very much. And I also, um, in, in sort of starting things out, I want to acknowledge and, um, and really recognize that the work I'm describing here is um, the collaborative effort of the Women Writers Project team. Um, which as Brian notes, goes back a really long ways. Um, my colleagues, Sarah Connell and Ash Clark and Sid Bauman. Sid um, has been at the Women Writers Project since 1990, um, which is kind of extraordinary. And also the, um, the students and staff and advisors who go back now close to 35 years. Um, it's really been an extraordinary accumulation of, um, of labor and uh, ingenuity and expertise. And um, it's a pleasure to reflect on it and um, and there's you know richness when I start to think about a topic like the one that I'm trying to tackle today. So, um, but I'm going to start with an example that's not um, from the Women Writers Project. Um, uh, something that I think will help us see the fissures within the facile phrase "digital text," um, which is a text I'm, I'm uh, a phrase I'm deeply invested in, but which I think I, I mostly want to sort of problematize and unpack in the in the next forty minutes or so. So um, as part of my work for the Digital Scholarship Group in the Northeastern University Library, I'm a collaborator on the Digital Archive for American Indian Languages, Perseverance and Preservation, which focuses on developing an online environment for language learning based, sorry, language learning based on a digital archive of historical Cherokee language documents. And you can see a sample here. Um, this slide shows a prototype of the interface um, for the project. Um, and it's actually, um, the slide is a little confusing, but basically what I'm showing you is both tabs in the, um, in the interface. So if you were actually at the website, you could see either the translation or the original text, but you can tab between them. And what the slide shows is both of those views. Um, so we're showing here um, a, a prototype of the interface for the project, which allows the reader to view both the original document and also a transcription and translation. So the goal is to put learners in touch with their documentary history, with the history of, of the written record of their language um, and all of its variation in terms of region and um, you know, chronology and personal um, style and level of education and so forth together with linguistic resources that can help the learner um, make sense of the um, the writing system, the language, its etymologies, its phonology, et cetera. And so what we see here, you know, nonchalantly represented in a, in a web page, is actually an incredibly complex interplay of different digital textualities. Um, there's an image of text that was written by hand in Cherokee using the Cherokee syllabary, uh, which is a writing system developed by the Cherokee people in the 19th century through which they rapidly achieved, I gather, near universal literacy. And that writing is itself on top of a printed form in English. Um, the Cherokee portions have been transliterated into the Roman alphabet using several different possible transliteration systems. And they're also shown in here a loose English translation and also a um, uh, word by word um, English translation. And those two happen to line up quite well, but um, if you saw more of it, there, there are places where the loose translation gives more sort of evocative sense of the language. Um, the display on the right is based on data that resides in a database in which each attested word in the document is linked to a deeper aquifer of language in which grammatical structures such as parts of speech and affixes and rules for combining words and so forth um, can operate and also um, be inferred, but they can also be um, exceptionalized. In other words, the, the, there are rules being expressed, but also outliers and situations which are not, you know, where this document varies from what is sort of formally recorded about the language. And the text, in addition to being captured in this linguistic database, is also represented within the project in TEI markup, um, although that's not represented here in the interface as yet. Um, and the TEI markup gives us a document with editorial layers that can capture variant versions, as well as annotations by community members and translators, and also potentially um, the markup can capture things like um, key semantic features, 
um, genre features, um, the interplay between, for example, in this case, printed document and handwriting and so forth. So, you know, if the phrase, the digital text now rolls off our tongues so easily, um, like a familiar thing, um, you know, both an abstraction whose referential scope we're comfortable with, and also as a kind of phenomenon that we, we might say, you know, we know it when we see it and we see it all the time. This example, I think, returns us to a confrontation with some of its complexity, both its conceptual complexity and its technical complexity and its complexity as a space for our minds to operate. So um, the observant among you um, will have noticed a slight shift in my title from um, evolving models of digital scholarship to evolving models of digital textuality. Um, and um, my purpose today is to revisit the history of that complexity, um, to, to reawaken our minds to what the digital text has meant in the past and where it has presented some of its most salient and most interesting conundrums. Um, but I think the implications for digital scholarship will also be clear. So I haven't uh, abandoned that topic, but just kind of mapped it onto um, the specific questions about textuality that I think are, are gonna be manifest. And I'll also say in kind of prelude that this is not by any means gonna be a comprehensive history on um, which would take way too long. Um, but more of a kind of highly selective exploration of how that history has unfolded for the Women Writers Project, which um, as we've noted already has its origins nearly 35 years ago um, in the late 1980s when concepts of digital textuality were starting to be seriously explicated and theorized. So it was a, a, a great time to be founding a project that was going to turn out throughout its lifetime to be deeply engaged with questions of what we mean by digital textuality and what um, what, what effects th those meanings have, why it might matter. So um, I'd like to start with a very concrete, very local textual situation and one that is poised significantly between several different information regimes um, that have claims on our ideas of what a, a digital text might be um, or should be. Um, and that, uh, the situation is the simple page break. Um, so the page break, of course, is the stuff that happens at the boundaries between pages. So this is an example from Margaret Cavendish's Na Nature's Pictures. Um, and the, uh, I actually have the date wrong. This is the 1656, not the 1671. Um, but the stuff we're gonna focus on is the stuff that's happening at the bottom of page three and the top of page four. Um, and, you know, the the boundary is kind of a notional thing. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a gap. Um, it's it's a it's a non place. Um, and the question of what is being broken, whether it's the stream of text or the paper, um, all of those things come into play when we start to think about the digital text. Um, some of the stuff that's happening, this, so this slide here is now representing um, the, uh, the, the, the bits of page, and then in the middle is the markup, um, as for example, the Women Writers Project represents it using um, the TEI guidelines. So some of the stuff that's at stake here in the page break is words and characters that can be said to be on the page. right? There actually is, there are ink particles on the paper, embedded in the paper. And these, we can argue, need to be transcribed. So these are things like catchwords, like the word lady, um, the running head, which includes the page number, so the, the, the four in parentheses down at the bottom, um, the signature, so the B2 portion, which tells the printer how the pages, how the printed pages are to be assembled to make the finished book. And there are potentially other pieces of the, of the page break apparatus that also um, come up that aren't represented here, um, things like press figures and uh, other little details like that. So we think of this sort of this ink on the page as one primary fact about a page break. Some of this, um, some of the some of the things that happen um, during the page break are more abstract. So the concept of the break, which is an artifact of the material vehicle of the text, and in fact it's an artifact of this particular vehicle, this particular 
printed document distinct from other potential manifestations of this text, um, you know, other editions which might have page breaks in different places or uh, pages of different sizes, that kind of thing. Um, so it's the, the, the break is an abstraction and it's also an absence, it's a gap, it's a between in our flow of text. And the representation of this abstraction, the, so in, this, in, the, in the encoding we see here, the, the PB element, which captures the, the notional uh, moment of transition between the two pages, and then the milestone element, which gives us information about the abstraction that is the new page, that is to say the, the B2 verso um, page. Um, that representation is not a mimesis of something that's tangibly present, but it's rather a kind of a bringing into being of something else. These, these elements are in the service of establishing a model of the text in which pages, the construct that we think of as a page, have marked boundaries and number sequences and which are navigable using things like number sequences um, the sequence of signatures, et cetera. In other words, the, these abstracted elements are a way of bringing into uh, a kind of real informational uh, life things which are really part of our, our notional idea about the book and about what the book means to us as users of, of it um, in a particular way, right? Not users of it as a doorstop or a weapon, but as an apparatus for delivering text to us. So, Let's explore the consequences of these ideas a little bit further, following the train of thought of a Women Writers Project encoder, for example, um, and recapitulating some research um, that the WWP has, you know, has been occupied in, in, in its early decades. For one thing, where does the break go in relation to things like chapters? So this example here has the break appearing between two lines of poetry the L at the top of the page and the L at the bottom of the page. Um, so the break happens kind of in the middle of a flow of a poem. Imagine that um, a chapter ends at the bottom of page uh, B2 recto and a new chapter begins at the top of page B2 uh, verso. So each of those chapters is um, encapsulated within the TEI markup as, as a division, something that has a kind of a wrapper around it that says, here are the boundaries of the chapter. Where does the chapter end? Does the chapter end at the end of the first piece of paper? Does it wait to end until we get to the heading of the next chapter? As readers, when we turn the page, at what point are we aware that the new chapter is starting? Does that awareness play into our sense of where that boundary should actually take place. Um, does it matter whether our um, publishing software has opinions about this? So if, if the, if you know your uh, you know TEI publishing tool is going to put the heading in a weird place, if you put the chapter break and the page break in a weird relationship, should that change your opinion about where those things should occur in relationship to one another? Another question. What is the informational difference between the ink on the page and the structure that's signaled by that mark? So the difference between transcriptional encoding, so the um, in this case, the MW type equals sig B2, that's an actual transcription of the, the characters that appear in ink on the page versus the informational encoding, which is captured by the milestone element where the the sort of regularized or idealized or fully uh, systematized version of the signatures is, is represented. Is there in fact a, a kind of a, a, a deep ontological difference between those two systems or is one just a kind of a, um, a kind of a normalization for convenience? Another question, what aspects of the ink on the page are informationally substantive? So for example, if we're encoders and we see that four page number with the parentheses, are the, are, are the parentheses just decoration? Are they something that affects our understanding of the page number? Should they be captured in the PB element? Should they be part of that numeral four? Should they be captured within the MW type equals page num? Are they significant enough 
to be worth transcribing or are they just an artifact like the fact that the page number is centered or something like that? And this partly boils down to a, a, a larger question, which is what pieces of information are useful and for what? Like, what do they contribute to our model of the digital text? And these are questions I'm not gonna answer, but just to say that, you know, if you're a, a project, a TEI project like the WWP, you have long meetings about this. And then, you know, long meetings about every other uh, possible type of question you could ask about every other aspect of the document along the same lines. This interplay of materiality and informationality and usage behavior um, is just, it's an endlessly fascinating problem boils down to the question of what is a digital text. If we were planning out a, a semester long seminar, um, we could zoom out in some fascinating directions that use this example as a kind of point of departure for an exploration of early 1990s era debates about digital textuality. And I'm just gonna um, highlight a few of those um, to give uh, some examples. First of all, um, one would want to look to editorial debates about what the significant textual object is, irrespective of how the digital world thinks about that. So is it, for example, the text, so-called, that's described by Anglo-American editorial theorists in the tradition of people like Thomas Tanzel? So in that sense, the text is the informational freight carried by the material vehicle, but not reducible to the material vehicle itself. Or is it the tangible object that circulated and was in people's hands and could be annotated, in which case a transcriptional and modeling approach might have a very different attitude towards, um, towards the document. Um, whose text is it? Is it something that, is it an account of the author's aesthetic intentions, the editor's critical synthesis, the object that circulated to readers, the result of some complex social contributions um, in the manner that D.F. Mackenzie and Jerome McGann focused on? Um, is it the unfolding genesis from the author's mind? In other words, all of these different um, editorial approaches and approaches to, to theorizing the editorial space have a direct application to the questions that we're raising here about the, um, you know, how text markup can and should model a document, a text, an artifact, uh, an information stream, et cetera. So that's one, one possible debate that you could spend several fruitful weeks in your, in your hypothetical seminar on. Another topic um, is debates about what a, a, a digital text should be, right? Do our aspirations for it focus on its virtuality? Um, you know, the idea that somehow the digital text is casting off the shackles of print and becoming nimble and fluid. Or are we more attached to a scholarly concept of fidelity, right, with a focus on providing access to inaccessible and rare research objects, where having confidence that the digital text is faithfully carrying those objects to us as researchers is, is perhaps you know, the most important thing. Certainly in the 1990s, there was intense anxiety about the, the feebleness, the, the corruptibility of the digital text. Um, in relation to research aims. Um, and, you know, accompanying those uh, questions is the issue of how much kind of added resolution, how much the digital text becomes almost like a prosthesis for us in being able to see aspects of the text that we couldn't see before. So um, in cases of, um, you know, the Beowulf um, manuscripts where things have been burned, but if you use a special kind of, um, uh, you know, photographic technology, you can reveal things that are, that are not visible. Um, or similarly, magnification technologies, all of these, um, you know, play into our sense of what a digital text could be or could be for. Um, a third possibility, um, uh, the focus might be on the digital text's exposure of editorial method, right? The, the idea that editorial transparency becomes possible in a way that it isn't in um, a digital uh, sorry, in a, in a pre-digital edition. Um, in the 1990s, you know, it was extraordinarily important, or it seemed extraordinarily important that the digital text gives us a, a layered information system in which the text and the editorial interventions into the text can be disentangled and shown, and in which alternatives can be made manifest to the reader in ways that then empower the reader as a kind of proxy editor, um, as someone who has 
uh, a role to play in the editorial ecology that isn't simply that of being a passive uh, consumer of decisions that are already that have already been made. So that's a that's another good chunk of a of a seminar, um, and a third nice uh, unit could be on um, debates about the role of markup. Um, and this is, you know, clearly an area where the Women Writers Project had a lot of um, a lot at stake. Um, is markup primarily a mode of interpretation? Right? Is it a way of recording and sharing local insight, um, or is it a way of creating a kind of semi-objective or consensual, uh, uh, you know, a broadly shared discipline-wide reality, for example, in which texts are, you know, added and heaped up and become a kind of, of of shared um, patrimony, as it were, a digital patrimony um, that then enables, you know, research, um, puts research on some sort of solid footing. Um, or is it a way, is markup really creating a model? In other words, something that's more like an argument, not as local and uh, individualized as interpretation, but not as uh, stolidly uh, objective or, um, uh, unarguable um, as uh, you know, a kind of simple research corpus, but something that is that in itself carries um, a rhetoric, and that's certainly the position that I'm fond of, and that um, Fotis and I explored um, in the uh, in the shape of data. So those are some. Now I kind of want to teach that course. <laughs> um, those are those are some of the places um, that we might uh, that we might focus. Uh, and those were all questions that were, you know, if we're if we're tracing a history here, that were some of the most potent questions um, that were at stake in the, I think, in the early, uh, the early periods of the Women Writers Project's research. So, I want to look next at another sort of modality of the digital text, which is to think of the text as words. Um, the questions that we've been looking at so far are, are like a window into a 1990s era digital textuality seen from the perspective of the Women Writers Project. And these kinds of transcriptional and encoding challenges continue to occupy us. But as the collection of, in Women Writers Online has grown, it's now I think over 450 texts and over 11 million words, thanks to Margaret Cavendish, um, we've been starting to think about the collection as a mid-sized research corpus. And you know, while it's no, my, by no means big data, it's still big enough data to do some interesting things with. So here again, I'm gonna zoom in on a, a small and concrete example um, through which to sort of sketch in another set of energies and questions that are animating the idea of, of digital text. Um, so the, the WWP's forays into semi-big data um, which take advantage of our, of our little mid-sized text corpus, have focused largely on word embedding models, um, which is a machine learning technique in which a corpus of documents is represented as a, a vast array of mathematical vectors. Um, and that, if that idea, many of you may be familiar with word embedding models, which is great, but for those of you who aren't, it may, uh, that phrasing may sound um, kind of forbidding. And so to make it possible for novices to experiment with word embedding models, and also to make it possible for teachers to teach with word embedding models without having to first cover like vector math, um, we developed a simple toolkit called the Women Writers Vector Toolkit. Um, beginning with internal funding and now continuing under an NEH Institute's grant. And the toolkit allows you to explore a set of pre-trained word embedding models in which the 11 million word corpus has been analyzed and processed to create a model in which each word is located in multi-dimensional space. Basically, if you think of of it as like a word cloud, except it's not a two-dimensional word cloud, it's not a three-dimensional word cloud, it's an n-dimensional word cloud where n is related to the number of total words in the corpus. That's essentially the, the space we're trying to navigate here. And so words in the trained model that are used in similar contexts within the corpus become neighbors within this high-dimensional space. So we can discover 
semantic relationships between words, and we can explore those relationships and learn something about the concepts that they represent by looking at these clusterings and these neighborhoods. Um, and the specific measure of, of neighborliness, if we can use that term, is something called cosine similarity. And if that reminds you of high school trigonometry, it is no accident. Um, the cosine similarity of two words basically represents the angle between the vectors for those two words. So if you imagine the, the corpus or the model as being like a, an immense dandelion, right? There's that little center and then there's all this stuff kind of radiating out from it. And you think about the angles between the little seed bits in the dandelion, that's what the cosine similarity is measuring. So, you know, over here, there's a cluster of words that have to do with, you know, love and uh, romance. And over here, there's a cluster that has to do with like banking. Um, so that's, that's the, the fastest and lousiest explanation of word vectors I've ever given. Um, anyway, the larger the cosine similarity, the closer the two words are related. And we'll see that coming up um, in what follows. So similarity and, and neighborliness here doesn't necessarily mean that the words have similar meanings, but it means that they tend to show up in similar contexts. In other words, they, they are used in the discourse in analogous ways, which gives us some very interesting things to explore. Um, and I'm gonna give some concreteness to this by um, now looking at the vector toolkit. And I'm, I'm not gonna do a live demo here, um, but I encourage you to play with the, um, the lab yourself at the link at the bottom of the screen, because um, it's pretty neat. Um, but I have a whole raft of screenshots, so you've been warned. So first, just a kind of quick um, overview uh, to kind of familiarize ourselves with how this works. Um, one thing we can do with this interface um, is we can query the model. We can say, I have a word, where is it in the model and what are its neighbors? Who, who, who are near it in, that, in, our, in our magic dandelion? So in this case, um, a query term woman yields a whole bunch of words which are somewhat similar, which are related in vector space to this word. And the cosine similarity is the number, the long multi-digit number um, on the right. And as a rule of thumb, any cosine similarity greater than about 0.6, I think, is considered, you know, reasonably, reasonably relevant, reason, reasonably neighborly. So we can see here that that is being confirmed. Um, and as I noted a moment ago, these are not synonyms, but these are words that are, co that come into the same context. So where a text uses the word woman, it might also use the word man it might also use the word child or gentleman. In other words, these are words for people in a context that includes their gender and familial role, let's say. We can also compare two models. So one of the nice things about the vector toolkit is that the, um, it includes models trained on different subsets of the Women Writers Project corpus and also um, models that draw in texts from other corpora. So for example, we have um, models based on the text creation partnership. We have models um, that draw in texts which the Victorian Women Writers Project generously shared with us. So here we're comparing the earliest part of the Women Writers Project corpus with the latest part of the corpus, the 19th century portion and the Victorian Women Writers Project. And the word grace, as we can see, changes its meaning very significantly in the earlier period, it has a lot more to do with kind of moral grace and religious grace, religious forms of grace, um, and also kind of royal grace. So liberality, favor, those are the sort of noblesse oblige kind of grace. Whereas in the later period, it's much more about feminine grace and grace as a form of uh, beauty, uh, as, a, as a, you know, an attractive property. So that's something interesting we can do. We can see how the word has changed its neighborhood over time. And we can also create more complex vectors. Since vectors are just complicated numbers, we can add and subtract them to create more precise semantic spaces. So for example, in this case, looking at the neighborhood of grace on the left, where we've removed the part of that neighborhood that has to do with beauty. And what we get is a much more um, strongly uh, religious 
uh, concept of grace with beseeching and blessing and granting and humbleness. Um, whereas on the right, where we add beauty, we say, let's combine these two vectors and say, we want the, the aspects of the grace neighborhood that are also part of the beauty neighborhood. And here we get uh, a much stronger signal around um, sort of attractiveness and loveliness um, and, uh, and things like that. So with these basic concepts in mind, um, I want to look at another example that's more closely related to our earlier um, reflections about the physical and virtual text, um, looking at the comparative semantic scope of the words book and text and page. So I found this fascinating. It, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to get when I, when I did this query, but I think what we're seeing here is that with book, we're getting a sense of the book as a document in which things like genre are visible. And also I think some of the intellectual apparatus of publication, so authorship, uh, titling, things like that. With text, there's a remarkable alignment with the domain of the scriptural. So this is a, a much more strongly biblical sense of what, a, of what a text is. And with page, not unexpectedly, we're in the space of the physical mechanics, right? We're back in the zone of the page break. And in fact, we're quite literally in the zone of the page break because all of those numbers are the things that tend to show up in uh, contexts where the word page is being used in things like tables of contents or indices or in um, references, bibliographic references. So let's look at a few more um, complex vectors. Here's one where I've added book and text on the left and I've added book and page on the right. And I think here we're seeing highlighted and intensified the difference between the concept of the book as a text in that um, sort of Tanzelian uh, way of thinking about it as, a, um, as a, a primarily informational space, something where meaning is, is really at stake. Whereas book and page brings us very much into that physical space, the idea of the book as an object. And if we do another quick experiment, here's the word poem inflected through page or word. And here I think we see the way in which the page vector localizes us within the poetic domain to the elements that organize the poem as a printed information system, right? In other words, these are still informational, but they're the kinds of information that are relevant to the sort of the presentation of the poem as a, a kind of a realized text, things like verses, stanzas, prefatory material, volumes, lines. Whereas when we align the poem with words, what we get is more the uh, kind of the language -y aspects of it, quotation, translation, written and writing. So one could go on. I mean, this, there's, this becomes an endless rabbit hole once you start getting into it. And I will say this is a very um, lightweight use of a tool that has a lot more potential analytical heft to it once you get past uh, the simple user interface and can actually use the word embedding model using a programming language um, like R to query the model directly. So this is a kind of a, um, a quick, let's say a quick demo. But I think, you know, taken together what these examples show us is, um, a set of points that sketch a separation between the material and the scriptural, and maybe also that trace the strong early association of books and texts with holy writing. Um, just one last example here, um, looking at word, again, from in the earliest part of the Women Writers Project and in the latest part, and we see how completely um, the, trans the transformation has been made um, between the word as really, um, you know, the word of God um, versus the later use of word with an emphasis almost exclusively on spoken language. And a similar, um, a similar comparison of book, right? The, the, the early book is a very authoritative um, space, whereas the later book is a, a more practical um, you know, what are we using this for kind of thing. So a few observations just to round off um, this part of the, um, of the presentation. First of all, that the digital text we're examining here is not any longer 
a document or even a set of documents, right? It, it starts as something that is termed in the, uh, in the technical language as a bag of words. And then it becomes something even more abstracted. It becomes a model of a textual corpus in which what is being brought to intelligibility is the semantic neighborhoods within the shared discursive space of this collection, right? It's, uh, it's not, there's nothing here that, that can be directly traced back to specific documents. And it's completely ahistorical, except when we're able to artificially construct a comparison by setting two models side by side as we, as we do here. It has no knowledge of the boundaries between texts, let alone any facts about them, such as authorship or location or length or genre, right? So it's, it's really just a set of little atoms, of word atoms floating around in this, um, in this space and um, atoms that know something about the semantic spaces they came from. That's really all they carry with them. And if we compare this kind of model with the earlier model of a text that XML really instantiates, you know, there are some similarities in the sense that both are abstracted away from the textual sources that we're familiar with as books. But this is modeling something completely different. It's modeling a universe of language that's attested in documents rather than modeling the structural or rhetorical or generic space of an individual text. And it's also worth noting that the set of word embedding models that are gathered in the Women Writers Vector Toolkit, um, unlike many of the word embedding models that are out there kind of in the wild, do carry with them some traces of their origins in the WWP's XML collection. So I'm saying that, you know, it's a historical, it's, um, you know, a bag of words, but um, our word embedding models are, are cleverly constructed because they have their roots in our TEI markup, we're able to um, filter uh, the bag of words as it is created based on where in the XML structure the words are coming from. So for example, if you were paying close attention, you might've seen a menu in which the list of available corpora was visible. And many of these are, are created by taking the WWP's XML markup and using it to extract explicit sub bags, let's say, from the, from the bigger bag of words that represent things like specific genres or time periods or that exclude or include certain kinds of paratexts. So that um, we do have the ability uh, to a certain extent to study things like genre um, using word embedding models, but we have to treat it as a problem of corpus construction, model construction, rather than as something that's innately there in the model, um, you know, just by, by nature of the type of model we're building. In the final portions of this presentation, I'd like to shift our attention to textual and human interconnections. Um, and I think that's, you know, it, it, the, 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 the emergence of network analysis as sort of like the, the watchword of the second decade of the 21st century um, really feels significant to me. And I think that even as network analysis as a technical term has a very specific application, there's also a kind of larger metaphorical sense in which networks have become something we know how to think with in a way that um, is more mature, um, even though it has you know, long roots back to you know, hypertext um, and of course, um, you know, theorizing the early web and so forth. I think looking at a corpus in the way we have been um, just a moment ago as a kind of a puree uh, in which the specific textual origin of individual words is lost, it's sort of like the ultimate experience of intertextuality, right? These uh, semantic spaces that become visible in word embedding models, um, you know, whether it's the sacral book or the literary page or the, the graceful beauty or whatever, they are purely inter as forms of textuality, right? They don't have um, a kind of a, a concrete locale in the way that uh, something like a metaphor might. 
And I'm reminded of uh, Michael Whitmore's suggestion um, that, a, quote, a text might be thought of as a vector through a meta table of all possible words, which is kind of a mind blowing idea, right? That, that you have this immense space and that a text is just, in effect, the path an idea takes through all the possible words that there are. Um, but clearly some arrangements of words become navigable routes through which many texts are routed. And so to understand those kinds of arrangements, we get sent back to the individual texts for a better understanding of how we get from something as concrete as a document to something as abstract as discourse or semantic field. So it's, there's a space in there that's, that I think is worth ex exploring that neither the single document approach nor the bag of words really gets us to. So the Women Writers Project has just completed an NEH funded uh, collaborative research initiative called Intertextual Networks, in which we explored the ways in which women writers referenced other texts, both directly and indirectly. So citation, um, allusion, paraphrase, parody, all different kinds of references. And um, shortly, we're going to be publishing a bibliography of all the works referenced by Women Writers Project texts, as well as an interface through which one can explore the kinds of intertextual gestures that are found in Women Writers Online. Um, it's going to be very cool. Um, anyway, our research collaborators for this project developed exhibits which traced a variety of different kinds of intertextual resonances, including uh, influence and translation, all different kinds of things. And these are being published in Women Writers in Context, which is our exhibit series, um, open access exhibit series that's published at the Women Writers Project site. And in combination with the WWP's recent planning grant on representations of racial identity, this started me thinking about, and this was just kind of a random thought and probably not that original, um, but it, it started me thinking about The Blazon, which is you know, a sort of literary set piece that pays homage to female beauty in terms that now strike me as being organized around whiteness and even around an explicitly colonizing whiteness. Um, so the classic example of um, The Blazon is you know, in uh, Spencer's Amoretti, which I remember from uh, English 100 as a freshman in college um, being presented to me as the blazon. Now you, now you know this thing. Um, and I started thinking about how one might find blazons in the WWP collection to, to start to think intertextually about the blazon and about the work that the blazon trope is doing um, in texts by women. Um, and also about what one might do to situate these within a larger discursive space of racialized representations of the body with the ultimate goal of building some kinds of formal connections among them that could be explored by readers. So, you know, maybe building an exhibitor of some kind that would give readers a way to uh, navigate through the Women Writers Online co collection thinking with the blazon format. So this is a project that, you know, who knows, this, this, this talk may be as far as it gets, but um, as a starting point, I um, first thought of searching for the phrase ruby lips, which is a kind of uh, a key term for the, for the intertextual blazon and one that I thought would be least likely to have uh, distracting uh, connections to other, other semantic spaces. And indeed, if we look at the Women Writers Vector Toolkit, we can see that there's a strong correlation between the term, the, 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 the pairing of the ruby vector and the lips vector um, and other elements of the traditional blazon, right? Ruby lips also gets us pearly cheek, vermeil, cheeks, rosy, sparkling, uh, vermilion. So there's, there's a, a blazon-like neighborhood um, that might, if we had more than 10 terms on our list, might even go further um, than this. And um, so then having, having kind of established that there was this little neighborhood going on, um, I searched for Ruby Lips in the Women Writers Online collection just as a, as a collocate. And that search yielded several fascinating examples. In fact, out of, I think there were 17 texts where those words are found in, in close proximity, at least six of those seem to include deliberate explorations or reworkings of the blazon as a literary trope. 
Um, but what's more striking is the specific ways in which that trope is itself troped. So three of them are satirical. And um, part of the effect of the intertextual reference here is precisely to enable the nimbleness of the satire. It sort of, it stands on the legs of the giant, which is the blazon. And this um, kind of satirical reapplication of, of the blazon is also you know, common out there. I'm sure many of us have um, seen examples um, in, our own, in our own studies or in courses that we might've taken. Um, the recognizability of the uh, ruby lips when taken together with other anatomical markers of the blazon tropes of so the cheeks, the teeth, the complexion, the forehead and so forth. It provides a kind of um, frictional structure, I think, that marks out crucial boundaries of gender and nation and class in these three examples. So the, the effeminacy of the young man um, in the first example from Margaret Cavendish, um, the foreignness of the Swedish woman and then the comical artlessness of, of Mrs. Doughty um, in the um, Sant Lever play, where she's um, described in the uh, uh, cast of characters at the beginning of the play as Mrs. Doughty, a, Somers a Somersetshire widow come to town to learn breeding. So these are these are certainly cases of, of kind of like the anti-blazon, let's say. And you know, they're all working. Uh, intertextually off of each other if one if one is reading the corpus um, as a whole. The other three blazons are marked by tragedy or pathos. So um, in, in the Chandler poem, Jephthah's Vow, um, immediately after this description of Jephthah's daughter, the girl runs out to meet her father who has vowed to kill the first household member that he sees. Um, so this is a, a classic, um, a classic episode from the Bible, and um, there's a moment that I'm not quoting here where there's a kind of an anti-blazon where her, her face becomes ashen, and you know all of the attributes that were that were described here are kind of reversed through the tragedy of of what she's about to experience. In Rosen's *The Inquisitor*, um, this description of Zelia, the fairest among the daughters of Arabia, uh, turns out to be a prelude to violence. Um, in which Zelia is kidnapped and enslaved by the Christian um, whose life she's saved. And she ultimately, um, she ultimately throws herself into the sea and, and is killed. And in Clark's The Eskimo, um, Camara, who's the ex Eskimo woman in the description, is discovered in a grove having been attacked and gravely wounded by her husband's jealous would-be lover. And she's ultimately adopted by an English family and brought back to England on condition that she adopt English dress and subject herself to English culture and in effect become a model, um, a model English woman in the way that the blazon sort of pulls her in that direction at the outset. So whereas in the, in the satirical examples, the blazon was essential to the satire, I think in these, in these tragic or pathetic scenes, its function is a little less clear, but I think the, culture, the cultural and narrative resonance of these scenes um, is in a way it's fully accessible without the set piece of the blazon. But I think it's significant that all three of these women are people of color and that they're, they're culturally marked. And I wonder whether perhaps the formal recognizability of the trope and the way that it establishes and uses its inter inter intertextual connections to make the literary ritual of formal beauty highly marked and highly visible may serve here as a way of pointing up their difference as racially marked. In other words, that friction is again important to the, to the effect. And at the same time, the same formal recognizability of the trope assimilates them to a kind of conventionalized and recognizable regime of virtue. So there's a kind of a shortcut there um, that the text doesn't have to argue for. It just kind of comes along with, with the package. So the, the, in both of these cases, the satire and the, the more tragic examples, the blazon, the intertextuality of the blazon becomes almost like a, a macro, a little piece of code that is doing its work. It's like a code library um, that can do its work without a lot of extra effort on the part of the, of the author. In the context of our examination of digital textuality, I think what's, in, what's really interesting here is our ability as readers to traverse these connections and to treat the reading process not as an immersion in a single narrative, but as a kind of reading across, right? In which the commonalities and the echoes 
and the shared lexicons become evident. Um, you can think of this as a form of distant reading perhaps, but it's one that brings the corpus level view into dialogue with the text level view in what has been called zoomable reading um, by my colleague Ryan Cordell or scalable reading um, by Martin Mueller. And if my story thus far has to some extent traced a kind of haphazardly chronological or at least developmental arc um, through the joint history of the Women Writers Project and concepts of digital textuality, references to distant reading or zoomable reading or scalable reading bring us I think to a key moment in that story. Um, one in which, first of all, the late 1980s vision of abundant large scale digital text collections has in some ways been very substantially realized, right? Like it seems like uh, a, a long time ago <laughs> that we, you know, we couldn't imagine having 11 million words in the Women Writers Project collection. Like that was just a, an astonishing, an astonishing goal to, to have hit. Um, but also a moment where as a result, we see the emergence of a set of methods for corpus-based text analysis whose claims by their nature are dependent on deeper claims about the representativeness of the corpus and about whether it is a good representation of what we want to study. In other words, the, 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 the trajectory that brings us to corpus-based research also brings us to a moment of reckoning where we have to think of our corpus as in, in terms of its adequacy with respect to the kind of research that we want to do. And the problem of representativeness is widely acknowledged, fair enough, although I think too often with a formula that kind of says, I know that as long as I demonstrate that I'm aware of this problem, I can go ahead with my work without actually addressing it. Um, I see that all too often as a, as a journal editor. And um, you know, there are also efforts to create better different corpora whether those are corpora with better metadata about the things that we matter that, that matter to us in terms of representatives, whether those are race or gender or um, you know whatever other properties, um, these might be more inclusive corpora that that you know cast a wider net that manage to to be more diverse. Um, these might be more balanced corpora, so you know a corpus that's half women and half men or something like that, um, or corpora that draw on a broader strata of cultural materials. So corpora that, that draw in archival materials, that draw in materials from community organizations, you know, whatever, whatever the solution might be. And these efforts are not by any means pointless exercises, right? They're, they're, they're important, but I'm gonna skip over them to get finally to the acknowledgement that our research corpora can never be representative in the strict sense, precisely because they are, and to the degree that they are colonial in nature. And by this, I mean that the long history of operations that lead to their existence as corpora, as digital corpora, which include literacies, authorship, publication, dissemination, archiving, curation, preservation, all of those things taking place before we even get to the point of creating the digital corpus, all of those operations act fundamentally to create representational discrepancies and silences and absences that can't be remedied by fuller discovery or by more comprehensive digitization programs or better metadata because the problem is anterior to those to those practices. In other words, our, our corpora, like our archives, can only ever be representative of that limited partial record that is made up as much of silence and gaps as it is of evidence and information as numerous scholars have documented. So digital textuality now in the era of Black Lives Matter has to also be, as Saidiya Hartman argues, a subjunctive textuality, a textuality of interpolated knowledge, a speculative narration that Hartman calls uh, critical fabulation, which I think is a really lovely term. Um, and the Women Writers Project has been working since this summer with a group of scholars on an internal planning grant focused on the representation of racialization in the WWP collection. And those discussions have been incredibly generative. And I wanna close now with just a few examples that I've found inspirational in thinking about what this kind of textuality might look like, what this kind of subjunctive textuality um, and uh, you know, a reparative textuality might look like. 
So first example, I was fortunate to hear a presentation by um, Kevin Adonis Brown in which he described an archives-based pedagogy where he has his students begin their research projects by annotating archival objects. So filling in gaps, uh, extrapolating new narratives, adding the voices of, adding their own voices. Um, elsewhere, he's described the, the archive as a generative space. Um, this is in a, a project he has called the discarded archive. Um, and it's generative in ways that contrast strongly with the static and preservationist ethos that predominates in the academic digital archival sphere and that traces back, I think, to the um, ideas of fidelity and access that, that we spoke of at the very beginning. So that's one example. The second example is the Early Caribbean Digital Archive, which is co-directed by my colleagues, Nicole Aljo and Elizabeth Maddock Dillon at Northeastern. Um, and the ECDA has for several years now um, been examining ways of using digital text encoding based on the TEI guidelines to perform a kind of inversion of textual representation. So instead of treating the conventional document as a sacrosanct structure, they're experimenting with ways of giving primacy and visibility and validity to the embedded narratives, which may be brief or ventriloquized or heavily mediated, um, narratives in which the voices of enslaved people can be discerned. And they've also been experimenting with holding workshops in which community members in the Caribbean contribute speculative narratives that provide histories and identities for unnamed enslaved and marginalized figures in colonial narratives. So here again, this idea of critical fabulation is coming very much to the fore. And finally, inspired by these examples as part of a recent, um, as part of the planning grant that I mentioned um, that the Women Writers Project is operating under now, which is focusing on representing racialization in the Women Writers Project collection, we are starting to plan something that we're calling uh, informally, and I hope this is a placeholder because it's not the most wonderful title ever, but anyway, we're calling it the Analyzathon, um, an event at which we plan to provide participants with versions of the Women Writers Project texts and ask them to simply experiment as open-endedly as possible with making race more visible in these texts. So this might include um, hand annotation of a printout or illuminating it like a medieval manuscript or adding multicolored highlighting or putting it on a board and putting string all over it or you know whatever people can come up with. It might also involve working with um, a marked up copy of the text with the XML to draw connections within texts or between texts or to highlight specific themes or to add a whole new markup lexicon that goes beyond the TEI to speak in different ways about the modeling of race or the representation of racialization. It might involve completely rewriting the text. It might involve reordering its parts or creating new derived texts with a completely different emphasis or ways of making meaning. In other words, treating the digital text as a subjunctive, as a set of possible worlds, rather than as an established fact. And we intend this event, frankly, as a way of making our own heads explode, and I think they will. Um, but we will use the results to launch us on a path of experimentation that we hope will result in some very different kinds of, of digital texts. And I hope that these new forms of digital textuality will be able to carry us forward into um, sort of better spaces uh, for our corpus. Um, I have gone on long enough, and I now really am looking forward to your thoughts and questions about digital textuality. So thank you all so much for your attention, and I will wrap up there and look forward to what you have to say. Great. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, whether you're muted or unmuted or have emojis, this is where we show our appreciation through various forms of Zoom clapping. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So we've reserved plenty of time for questions. I think um, a lot of us have, would love to talk about Women's Writers Project and the, the things that you explored in the talk today. Um, feel free to add your questions to the chat box or you could feel free to unmute yourself and just go ahead and ask. I think we have an okay size where we could do that. Julie, I'll, I'll start with a, a first probably unanswerable question, but maybe an easy one. Um, 
I'm working with Annalisa Holling, who's also on the call, to sort of start sketching out uh, something a little similar to the Women's Water Writers Project for uh, women's texts from the Iberian Peninsula. And at the beginning of your talk, as you were talking about just all the different ways in which you have to think about the text, you know, the textuality and of the page and all these different parts, I found myself thinking, yes, at what point do you decide to stop asking these questions that are, of course, endlessly fascinating and are, are all worth asking, and then just actually get on with the problem? Like, how do you, and, and so this is maybe a concrete question, like, how do you actually bookend that process that could take forever as you were trying to plan out an archive or a, a body of work? That is a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I am both a deeply pragmatic and a deeply um, impractical person. Um, so this question really resonates with me greatly. And I will say in my experience, the thing that has helped most in scoping those kinds of questions is having a clear idea of what kind of actionable outcome you're seeking. And thinking about what the role of the questions is. So for the Women Writers Project, we knew at the start that we wanted to create a collection of texts and you know, use that collection, give it to people to teach, et cetera, all those kinds of things. But we also knew that we wanted to be a research project. In other words, it was important to our identity and honestly important to our fundraising strategy to be a project that was a space for these questions. And what that did was it gave us a kind of, um, a kind of dialogue space where we could feel licensed to pursue those questions as long as we felt we were generating interesting research that other people could benefit from, but, but, but bookended by, or you know, stopped by the kind of countervailing sense that at some point we needed to also make a decision that was going to serve our goal of publishing something for a specific audience. And I think it's that sense of audience and the sense of what the, you know, in crude terms, what, what are the user needs that you are acknowledging? And I think for, you know, for any new project, coming up with that initial sense of user needs, motivations, um, that's the, one of the most important scoping gestures you can make because that then keeps you honest in terms of what is an important question and what is just a self-indulgent question. Um, and you may still find that you wanna ask the self-indulgent questions because they generate an interesting research paper or because they give context for the path not taken, um, or they record something that you wanna come back to and do at a later stage in the project. But it, but it definitely gives you a way of saying, okay, this conversation has gone on long enough, it's been fun, let's now decide what to do. And I think the same exact um, logic applies to questions of customization. You know, I often get the question of how you know when your schema customization is done. And it's, it's again, it's a question of why are you constraining your data? What are you gonna do with the data? Um, and I think in both of those cases, having a practical sense of why is, is the most important defense against uh, both solipsism and the never endingness of, uh, of these kinds of questions. Do we have another question? I think I have a couple too, but I wanted to a question. hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I have a question, but I, I, my video isn't working. So, um, hang on, let me see. Okay, there we go. Um, so my question um, has has to do. Actually, I have two questions. If that's okay, one is is sort more technical. How far are we in the sense of um, digital humanists from being able to do this kind of analysis on more like nebulous features. I mean, I've seen Meredith March Martin trying to do it on meter and things like that. And that always, you know, means somebody else is coming through and saying, oh, this is a meter. Um, and it's so that kind of inter intervention. And I was talking with Craig um, the other night about, well, how could you like compare style? Like what kinds of stylistic features could you have like grammatical patterns or syntactical patterns. And so I'm wondering, that's just a real question, like how far is the kind of analysis that you're doing with the embedded word from 
looking at more nebulous things? That's a great question. I, this is an area where um, I'm aware that other people are really specialists and good answers in this area are gonna come from specialists, but I will, um, I will go out on a limb. My sense is that there's now a very sophisticated and pretty well documented tool set for a lot of different, what you might think of as, it's a lot of different observational tools that can get at different aspects of textuality. So word embedding models are great if what you're interested in is uh, sort of clouds, lexical clouds from which you can infer semantics. Topic models are great if what you're interested in is sort of seeing how topicality bubbles out of a set of documents with certain properties. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of specialized analytical techniques that get at things like different theories of authorial style, right? And, and I, I gather in this, again, totally not an expert, but I gather that there are you know, lots and lots and lots of different theories about what distinguishes authorial style uh, you know, whether it's the little words or is it the, you know, TFIDF or is it, you know, is it the, the, the most common uncommon words or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of those, and, and that's a branch of research that's actually been around forever. Like I, I didn't include it because I don't know very much about it, but, you know, back in the 1990s when I started going to the early humanities computing conferences, the text analysis people were all stylometrists, right? They wanted to know things about authorial style. That was what mattered most of them next to um, doing, uh, being able to identify mystery authors. So, so I, I'm sure that there's a lot of sort of statistical sophistication there. I think though that the question is really, how do you know, how do you distinguish between the mathematical evidence that you're getting and how do you cross the gap between the mathematical evidence you're getting and the, the subtler context, a concept that you're really trying to think with, right? Because authorial style isn't the sum of term frequency, inverse document frequency, and hues, whatever, and et cetera. It, it's, a, it's something else of which all of those things are little tiny symptoms or proxies or operationalizations or something. And I think the really hard problem is knowing enough about those statistical methods and also having a kind of clear enough sense of what you mean by style to make that translation between those tools and what you're actually trying to learn. In other words, it's easy to be beguiled by a tool and think it's telling you something when it's actually not really speaking to your, your own sense of the problem. Um, but I think in technical terms, the tools are getting better and better. I don't know how close we are I don't know. I don't know how far there is to go. Um, I certainly see research that does, you know, interesting things in distinguishing fairly subtly between, you know, different authors, different periods of different authors. Um, I saw a, a wonderful article on Margaret Cavendish, which was showing, and I think it was using, yeah, it was using DocuScope, which is this awesome tool, um, which uses a kind of lexicon of rhetorical patterns like, um, uh, how can I describe this? It, it identifies hundreds of different rhetorical patterns that are things like, are you talking about uh, someone in the third person? Or um, are you asking questions? Or are you using abstract words? Or are you using concepts of futurity, right? Like all of these different kinds of things. And it treats each of those as a vector in the text. And this person was using this tool and was able to make really interesting arguments about, you know, how Margaret Cavendish's later philosophical writings pivoted from her poetic work. And it was, it was absolutely enthralling. So I guess I'm saying over and over again and never finishing the sentence. I think, I think, I think progress is being made, but I don't know how much, I don't know where the line ends. So I don't know how, what percentage of it we've traversed. Can I ask my second question too, which is completely unrelated? Sure. 
<laughs> okay, so my second question has to do with, no one here is gonna be surprised by this, um, fan studies and the archive of our own um, project that was the basis of, I don't know if you know, um, Abigail DeKosnick's um, Rogue Archives, um, which was a book about, you know, sort of alternate archives at the, um, not just in the internet, but it, it went in that direction. Um, and I was struck by, um, I mean, obviously, I don't, do you know, do you know that project, do you know archive of our own? I do, yes. In okay. fact, one of my students, um, Cara Marta Messina, is writing a dissertation on um, fan archives. Oh, that's fantastic. I would love to be in touch with that um, person because I, I, I'm so, I'm interested in the ways that, you know, so fans can't come up with organizing their stories, which are already in, have for a long time been thinking in terms of these networks that you're talking about. Like when you read around in a fandom, you're reading you're reading much more, you know, a kind of story of characters than you are a series of individual texts. Um, and I'm so interested in the ways that those those fans who were used to thinking about that and used to writing about that came up with organizing their stories in ways that could be funded. And I'm always wanting, you know, different different fields to 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 look at to look at that um, because it is so interesting to me also that it, that it's women again. <laughs> that are doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and other sexual minorities. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm not going to go on at, at such length mm -hmm. on that question, because I'm sure other people have um, yeah. things also. But but I will say that I think social, broadly speaking, social media is turning out to be very ingenious um, in showing ways of information organization that are not just expedient, but that are also sort of intellectually interesting and salient. So in Archive of Our Own, the balance between, for example, keywords that are fairly strictly regulated and keywords which are kind of semi-parodic and whimsical and keywords which are more sort of singletons or that mark out sort of specific sub areas, that's really interesting. Like from a library cataloging standpoint, it makes your head explode, it's awesome. Similarly, I'm on um, Ravelry. Any of you who's a knitter probably knows what that is. It's a social media thing for knitters and it's the world's best database. Everything is, it's like a massive knowledge graph about the fiber arts, it's fantastic. I would love to have a digital humanities project that was that awesome. So anyway, I yeah, I think there's a lot we can learn from those things. Other questions? Not too far off from what Anne was asking, I was really intrigued with uh, when you're talking about word vectors and and the uh, the blazon and and particularly the phrase like ruby lips. And the thing that like struck me and and I may have kind of got lost while you were saying this. So forgive me if I'm repeating what you're saying exactly. But the thing that struck me is that it was exactly that that re repeated co-occurrence of those words. And and so the fact of it's being exactly the same would lead me to think similar to what I'm saying about fans is that it's like um, some of the stuff I've, I've seen doing some fan research is that like when, people, when fans do the exact same thing, they do the exact same thing, but then a little bit different. And that small difference stands out by contrast, right? And so it seems that using the phrase like Ruby lips again and again, like points to it being parodical or points to it as you're saying, doing something so like um, pointing out something by contrast to it. So. I was curious about that more structurally, like zooming out from that particular analysis, if there are like ways that you guys have thought about that sort of like exact co-occurrence and then the networks of those exact co-occurrences as being in some ways like signs of parody or signs of uh, other like kind of like, uh, as you were saying, like external social neighborhoods that may signify something else and, and maybe doing that programmatically through the corpus of like, what are some like, unusual words that go together in ways they shouldn't, but then co come up again and again. That's fascinating, yeah. Um, I was a little sloppier actually in, in, my, in my presentation, I might not have made this clear, but the, um, the examples I was finding in Women Writers Online were not a literal Ruby Lips uh, collocate. They were, um, I set the window so that they could be within, I think, 10 words of each other. And, you know, in poetry, you know, there it gets kind of inflected. So like lips of Ruby hue or um, lips like rubies or whatever. So so I, I, I included all of those. And I, I didn't look at how, um, I didn't look explicitly at how often the phrase itself comes up, but I think it's comparatively rare. 
um, compared with the proliferation of just sort of adjectival rubinesses of nominal ellipses. Um, however, I, th I think your point is really well taken. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm really grateful to you, actually. This is, this is a really interesting insight. Um, because as you say, it's the recognizability of the core term that makes it possible for the variation to be perceptible as such. And that's what, that's how, and that's how intertextuality, I think, really, really works. Um, I do know of a few projects which are working with um, sort of, I don't know if it's really machine learning or if it's just like the vast application of machinery to the question of detecting all the unusual verbal echoes. Um, my colleague David Smith in uh, the CS department at Northeastern does a lot of work with um, textual reuse and detection of quotations. And he's working with um, my colleague Ryan Cordell on the Oceanic Exchanges and Viral Text Projects, which are looking at how uh, in periodicals, in 19th century periodicals, texts are reused and reprinted um, you know, widely and how they proliferate. And he's using um, this question of, you know, how do you detect what's a what's an actual verbal echo versus what's just words that always go together, like go together. That's not interesting because everybody says go together. But if we said go together gently, then that would be something that if you heard it, you'd be like, oh, they must have gotten that from somewhere. So I think this is something that people who study textual reuse are attuned to. And I don't know if the folks who study intertextuality from a literary perspective are hooked up with the folks who study textual reuse, but they should be. Um, and I feel like uh, if we weren't at the end of our intertextuality grant, but instead we're at the beginning of it, or if we were to write another grant proposal, which is a better idea, we would go knocking on David's door and say, okay, now we know what these people were reading. Now we could create the corpus of texts women read and we could get more of a sense of like, how selective are they being, or how can we work more tightly with this with these ideas of of parody and reworking, and and think more with more nuance along the lines of what you're saying. So so I love that, and thank you. That's really that's really cool. I have a, a kind of question that might lead to the question that I wanted to ask, but that speaks to this question about repetition with difference. There's a concept that I've been loving lately called the snow clone, especially in science fiction. So the idea that there's this phrase and you swap out one word and it just becomes this kind of constantly mutating thing. So what is this thing you call a kiss, right? <laughs> what is this thing you call an X? And you see it substituted and proliferating and it becomes funnier and funnier over time. Um, and it's a really useful kind of linguistic tool and it's a great tool for we're thinking about science fiction as a genre in particular. But the question that I had that I'm gonna like, kind of move into is in, in your time in digital humanities, Julia, have you, have you seen an arc or a change over time in terms of the interaction between computational linguists and the sort of big tent DH model that is kind of still a kind of unsettled <laughs> amorphous model, but uh, I, I'm just kind of curious if you have any insights about that relationship and its development over time. That is so interesting. Um, I feel like the, actually, you know what? I'm gonna just put on my headphones. My partner's uh, having a phone call, which it's now become more semantically available to me. Still hear me? Okay, cool. Sorry, my headphones are in total snip here. Speaking of fiber arts, um, so I feel like, unfortunately, there has not been as much interchange between the computational linguists and the digital humanists as one would have liked. And I speak as a journal editor who would love to see the subdisciplines of digital humanities talk to each other and also make greater efforts towards mutual intelligibility and mutual usefulness. Because I feel that computational linguistics in particular, now that everybody's interested in big data 
and in how we can understand language through large tools and stuff like that, it, it, it's, it's in a good position, right? They've got a huge body of expertise that, that the rest of us would love to have. I, I, having said that, I'm sure that there are I'm sure that you know the, the folks who are doing um, machine learning, et cetera, are steeped in that. Um, and you know, the fact that I'm not aware of it doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means, I, as I said before, I'm a manager these days, not a not a researcher. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where 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 more I can go with an answer, except to say that it it feels like a very useful connection to mine. And I think one of the things I wonder is whether um, techniques like pattern pattern discovery techniques, um, but also computational linguistics. I may be just totally about to get myself in trouble here because I really know nothing at all about what I'm about to say. I'm, I'm just, I, I want to speculate a little bit about the, the theory of language that computational linguistics brings to its um, development of algorithms, because I feel as though uh, those theories, even though they don't always get fully articulated, do make a big difference in how the tool operates with respect to what it posits as significant, or what it posits as a pattern, or what it posits as, um, you know, a un even a unit of meaning. Um, so yeah, maybe that's the that's the best I can do with that. I'm, I feel like it's a great question and not a great answer, but but thank you for it. Thank you for that. That's really kind of I've been it's been something I've been thinking about a lot, and it's helpful to kind of hear different perspectives on it. So thanks. I think also partly I'm foundering on the fact that my um, my grasp of the distinction between corpus linguistics and computational linguistics is a little feeble. And I it sort of boils down to one conversation I had with a lovely person that I met at a conference in Germany and we walked back from the conference site to the hotel and it was like a five mile walk. So we had a good long conversation in which I grilled her about computational linguistics and corpus linguistics. Um, but you know, it was the end of a long day. So I feel like I have the glow and none of the, none of the facts, but I feel like, you know, the difference between algorithmic versus observational approaches and theories of language matter there. And I think that that too informs how we think about machine learning versus statistical methods. In other words, there's a kind of an observational approach that's, that's been around for a long time, it's, it's sort of gathering statistics about corpora. And then there's this new sort of machine learning unsupervised um, approaches that are trying to sort of create models and infer patterns and things, which is, I feel like more on the computational linguistic side of things. But again, yes, getting myself in deep water. If there's anybody here who knows five things about these things, you probably know how wrong I am. Well, I'm sure some people at BYU do because they are they excel at computational linguistics. I am seeing though that we are, are up to the hour and I want to be mindful of Julia's time, especially in a different time zone. And I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, this session was recorded today, so we will distribute that to the Digital Matters Listserv uh, probably by next Monday. But thank you so much, Julia, for being here today. Thank you all so much for these questions and for your attention and for coming. And it's been it's been a true pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.